Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to begin. Uh, tonight, I'm going to do something special. I'm going to give Todd a gift. He knows it's coming, but I have to explain the gift. So if he dies between now and Sunday, it's my fault. I have um, some hot peppers that I grow, and this is my way of using up a little bit of time without really using it up uh, because some people straggle in late. But uh, anyway, uh, these are Trinidad scorpions. Come on, Todd. Come up here. Um, allegedly, a ho hot jalapeno has a Scoville rating of 10,000. These have a Scoville rating, supposedly, I think it's a little less than that. Maybe I just grow them wrong, of one and a half million. And so uh, this, this fool, I mean this fellow, <laughs> <laughs> says he wants some of them. He gave the last batch away and then left some in a bag and they rotted on him. So you, you open them up and when you get home and let them dry out. So I picked them in the rain today. And, uh, they smell sweet. <laughs> yeah, they are, they're sweet and... Do I dislike Todd? Uh, that's debated. Um, tonight we're going to look at a series of texts from the Gospel of Luke again. Um, before I go into texts, I give you some principles of interpretation that may or may not apply to these texts, or at least in some obscure way but it may help you in your own study or reading of Scripture, and if they do, that's great. If they don't, I'm sorry. Uh, so I, I apologize profusely. No, I don't. Uh, but these are principles that um, I find to be important. There are three of them up at the top of the page, and we're going to look at those first, and then we're going to look at a series of texts uh, up till the seventh chapter of... Um, the Gospel of Luke, and the seventh chapter contains a major story about eating with Jesus. And we have a couple minor things, and I'm going to look at those. And so this is what we're going to do this evening. Uh, before we do, we need to pray. And uh, I've been talking to you about evangelism, and one of the ways that of doing evangelism is to eat with people. It's a strange thing. I ate with a guy yesterday. His name was Todd, but <laughs> we, we did, uh, but actually Todd and I eat a, on, together on occasion, and uh, we, we have influenced, I think, at least she seems to, uh, the waitress at this one place, and um, she responds to us, and she knows exactly what we order, um, usually, although I tricked her yesterday. But uh, it's, it becomes a part of evangelism. Now, we didn't eat with her, but we asked her if there's something we can pray about for her. And you'd be surprised how people respond to that. And, um, but uh, eating with people, uh, it's one of the techniques that Jesus used. And we're going to close tonight with uh, the seventh chapter in which Jesus eats one of, the, one of those sinners well, he eats actually with a series of sinners, but there's this woman who's a sinner, but he also eats with a Pharisee. And it's occasionally people have the idea that Jesus hated Pharisees. He doesn't hate Pharisees. If you look, he accepts every invitation to eat with them, which is a way of accepting a person. Um, and see, um, I ate with my son this afternoon, we had a late lunch, and I didn't eat a big supper tonight, I'm sorry, but um, I still ate with you, and it's, it's, a, it's a real experience to eat with the people of God, and so this is one of the emphases that we're going to do in this series of lectures. As if I finish these texts, we're going to do something. I don't know what I'm going to do, but uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight seeking your presence, not just in this evening's worship and service, but in our lives, 
we pray that we, you would be with us when we go into public, when we're at home, when we wake up in the morning and we say our opening prayer for the day, when we, when we go through the day and we run into adversity, we pray that you would be with us and make yourself known. We pray, Father, for your presence. Um, we don't know always know how to discern your presence in our midst, but we trust that you're with us even when we seem to be far from you. We pray your blessing upon us uh, as we study these things. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, um, principles of interpretation. Oh, wow. I've covered this one. I'm not sure if it was here or at Mason. I teach at both churches every year, so uh, forgive me if I forget covered this one before, but this is a very important rule of interpretation on Scripture. Uh, when you're dealing with rules, quote-unquote laws, you have to remember that a greater law supersedes a lower law. And I've used this, I think, here, the illustration of the ambulance. Ambulances can run red lights. They can change lanes. They can do all sorts of things. They can speed, and no one seems to care except the person in it, you know, he, he cares. And cops will not stop an ambulance, okay? And woe unto us if we cause an accident or the ambulance causes the accident, you'll take the blame for it, I'm told, uh, unless it's obviously, obviously his fault. Uh, but the greater law is that an ambulance has the right of way all the time. That's how it works in biblical things. Certain things uh, have precedence. Jesus said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, which is greater, uh, showing someone mercy or offering a sacrifice in the Old Testament system while showing mercy was greater. Uh, people ask us, um, I, I'm assuming you believe what I do, I, I believe that when a person becomes a Christian, they get baptized, that baptism doth also now save you, that baptism is for the remission of sins. Well, what if the person doesn't get baptized? Well, Scripture never says, if not baptized. It doesn't say that. There might be a higher law, such as the thief on the cross. How do you explain the thief on the cross? God has a higher law, mercy. He can be merciful to whom he will be merciful. Uh, it's real simple, but I don't make the rules. If God, if, if there's someone in heaven that doesn't fit the rules that I think are to be followed, I'm happy. I'm happy if, when anyone's in heaven, when anyone is forgiven by God. So a higher law supersedes a lower law. We're going to run into that one tonight in one of the stories. In fact, the uh, first story that we run into, it's about that principle. Second principle. Um, we have to be aware of hedges. Now, you probably have, have a hedge or two, but you don't use that term. That's what the rabbis called it. A hedge is where you build a rule, a law, around a law to protect the law. You don't, per, you don't violate the law because you have this little hedge that says, oh, I'm not even going to go near that law, and I'm not going to transgress it because I've got this hedge. Uh, well, I always remind people when they start spouting to me, I shouldn't use that, that sounds negative, doesn't it, spouting, when they propose to me that I should follow their hedge. Okay, I'll listen to it. But I, I remind people that the first hedge that anyone ever built was Eve in the Garden of Eden. God commanded them, you don't eat of this tree, okay? You can eat any tree you want except this one, but don't eat of this one, okay? And Eve interpreted that mean, I'm not going to eat from it, and I'm not going to touch it. Well, the, God never said, don't touch it. Her hedge failed her because she didn't pay attention to her hedge. Well, hedges are fine and sometimes good, uh, but they are not always good. Okay, that's one of the things I warn people about. Now, this is 
part of one of the stories that we're going to look at is a rabbinic hedge. Okay, they, they can explain all sorts of things that the Bible doesn't explain. That's, that's what we're going to look at. Now, one of the things that I'd like to look at, and this is also part of these stories, is customs and traditions. Um, I don't know who, I heard a sermon once on this, and I thought the guy had a great outline. Three H's, the three H's of traditions, hurtful traditions. We do things, and they can become hurtful. Now, I'm going to give you an illustration. A hedge can be hurtful. When does a hedge become hurtful? But I, I thought a hedge was supposed to protect me and from doing a sin. Yes, it's hurtful when we demand that hedge of another person who doesn't accept it, who doesn't see it, and then condemn them because they haven't followed our hedge. That was one of the things the Pharisees did. They would make these rules to protect the rule, to protect the rule, to protect the rule. We're going to look at one in a minute. But um, that's, that's not the type of thing that we want. Um, then there are helpful traditions. Now, these don't all deal with hedges. A uh, hedge, when it is applied only to self. People say, do you have a hedge? Oh, sure. I have plenty of hedges. There are people I won't talk to unless my wife is there. Um, okay, you can figure that one out. I just won't talk to this person unless my wife is there. I'll talk to them if my wife is there. Okay, that's one of my hedges. And I've told her that hedge. Honey, I, I won't talk to that person unless you're here. And if you see me if trapped, you come up and join us. You know, that's a hedge. That protects me from whatever this person is about. Okay, that's, uh, that's something. Um, for example, uh, there's helpful traditions. For example, if you study the Bible, in the Old Testament, the synagogue is never, let me restate that, never, never mentioned. And yet, Jesus in Luke 4.16, let's read that one. Four sixteen, And when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. That's a helpful tradition. There's nothing about we must have a church building. Yet we do. It's helpful. We can get everybody in here tonight. It's a helpful tradition. Um, there's nothing that says... Um, you have to have musical instruments like drums and I think those are guitars. Uh, I don't always know what an instrument is. I know my grandson's violin. He goes like this. And I watch his lesson and he has to hold this finger up for some reason. And uh, But a violin in church is not hurtful. It's not commanded, but it is a helpful tradition. I, I can't wait for the day I can persuade that young fellow to uh, play his violin for us at church. Okay? Helpful. Um, here's a helpful one. Um, I may have explained. I explained this to some church recently. But, um, you know, the tradition. Or it's important which way you do it. Um, when I was at the Catholic seminary, I took some classes at, uh, they would cross themselves, so I'd always go, that's the wrong way to do it. You do it. If you're Eastern Orthodox, you start, you do boom, boom, boom. You end up over on the Eastern side of the Mediterranean. If you're Roman, 
you end up on the western side of the Mediterranean, <laughs> as if it really matters. But where did that start, the thing of crossing yourself? Would you cross yourself? Sure. Because it was in the arena when Christians were being uh, slaughtered what, by lions and tigers and bears, oh my, whatever they were slaughtered by, by gladiators. You couldn't get your voice above the crowd, but you wanted to say, I die as a Christian. Boom, 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 boom. You know, you, it was a helpful tradition in that context. Now, um, then there are harmless traditions. My favorite one, again, this was one of the Roman seminary. Um, I noticed when we would take tours of chapels or church buildings, we sometimes would do that, and I'm there, okay, I'd stand at the back of the line. But I noticed them all doing something, bending a knee. And I sort of got the idea, and they called it genuflecting. And um, why? It's submission to them. It meant nothing to me. It was harmless. See, and so you have to discern when is your tradition hurtful, helpful, or harmless? That's a hard one to, to uh, deal with. So what we have tonight is some indication of when Jesus found one of them, it defied the greater law, supersedes the lower law, it was a hedge that they violated, and it was a hurtful tradition, okay? That's one of the things I want to look at. So when we come to this, let's uh, go to chapter 6 of um, Luke's gospel. And I told you this last week, I believe, that there's this book written, Eating Your Way Through Luke. Luke has more about eating than any other gospel. And on, and this is a hard thing, um, and it came about when Jesus was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked some heads of grain, rubbed them in their hands, and ate them. Okay, sounds like a harmless enough thing. We're hungry, we're going through the field, and um, I don't know whether there's a path through the field or... They were tramping down the grain. I hope they weren't tramping down the grain. That would be kind of a hard thing to explain. You're ruining the guy's crop. But they pick some of the grain, or as they're passing by the field, and they see some grain, and they pick it, and they rub it in their hands, and then um, we actually have some rabbinic sources that tell us how you do this if it's not Sabbath day. You blow on it, and you blow off the chaff from the wheat or the barley, and then you have to be hungry to do that, but uh, you, you eat the grade. These guys are hungry. It's the Sabbath day. Now, um, what was their sin? If you look at this, uh, the, the text says, but some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Wait, what law did you break? Well, one of the laws that you could look at is the 20th chapter of Exodus. And then I had a problem this week with my computer. And I had all these things listed. And then I forgot when I rewrote the thing because my computer just trashed my document on Monday morning. <laughs> you... Yeah, I have problems like you do, uh, but it trashed the document. But Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, uh, you remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Six days you'll labor, on the seventh day you won't. Okay, where did they work? Well, when they reached out their hand and picked the grain, that's their first sin. Their second sin was when they rubbed it between their hands and... Then their third one was when they went, whew. they could eat it, that's not the sin, but they threshed and they prepared the, the grain for eating. Okay, is that what the law meant? Now, we're going to see Jesus' response to this, but this is one of the problems of traditions. Um, 
they have all sorts, and we don't know all of them because we don't know what exactly these guys held to because various rabbis held to various things. Um, there's a book of their traditions called the Mishnah, and uh, I have a quote from the Mishnah. It's, uh, this is in the one of Sabbath day, the Sabbath uh, rules of the Sabbath day, and this one was the very first rule. If on the Sabbath the beggar stands outside, that means outside the house, and the householder inside, and hit the beggar stuck his hand and put a beggar's bowl into the hand of the householder, or if he took something from the inside it and brought it out, the beggar is liable. So if, if I'm, I'm starving... And there's this kind fellow. Will you be the kind fellow? And uh, you're inside the house, and I, I stick my bowl in your house and say, could I have something to eat? And he kindly says to me, yes, let me give you something. And then when I take that bowl outside, I have committed a sin because I have worked on the Sabbath day. They have all sorts of rules, and we don't know all the rules uh, that were held at that time, but they, they're interpreting this, saying this is an absolute rule that you can't violate. Okay, this is hard for me to buy, especially if you remember last week we looked at Isaiah 58. What does Isaiah 58 say? You should share your food. One of the things on reinterpreting the fast was to share what you have. Oh, I won't share this, but somebody shared that with me, and I drank it. Was that what the law that, about not working on the Sabbath meant? Is it? That they, that one, that one is very explicit. You do not gather the manna, but the guy would go out and gather manna for his whole family. That would be, yeah, that would be the nearest they came to that. But holding your hand outside, inside, is that the intent of the law? Especially when the higher law is you should feed the hungry. What didn't these Pharisees do? Oh, they watched Jesus and his guys. But they didn't offer him any food. They're following them around, and they had a rule that says you can't walk. And I don't remember what, how much space it was in their terminology, but it comes out to about five-eighths of a mile. Unless, now here's how these rules work, unless you leave a piece of your property every five-eighths of a mile, and then you can walk more than five-eighths of a mile because you haven't walked past your property. How'd you come up with five-eighths of a mile? I don't know. I could, couldn't find uh, how that was. they came up with that. Okay, so this is a, an interesting thing. Okay, um, now what Jesus does is points out there are exceptions. Okay, let's assume that there is a conflict here between law and law. No, th threshing, eating, rubbing. Is that working or is that just feeding yourself? Okay, Jesus, if you notice, he said, notices, he points out that King David did quote, unquote, a greater violation than this, if you go into technicalities. Jesus answered, have you not read? Now, I always find those have you not reads very funny. I, I know I have a weird sense of humor, but um, because he's talking to guys who probably can quote the entire Old Testament. I've known two people in my life that one could quote the entire Old Testament and one could quote the entire New Testament. 
And um, if you know the preacher Ed Bowsman, he supposedly could quote the New Testament. And he said, I at one time or another have quoted the New Testament, but I heard him do 45-minute sermon one time where all he did was quote. And he, he did, the scripture says, and he would then quote this massive section of scripture. But it also says, and he quoted that section of scripture. And then I met a, a rabbi who had become a Christian, and he could quote the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. And I thought, oh, he has got it memorized in English. No, he just translated it in his head from the Hebrew to the English. Wow. So have you not read? Buddy, I have read it, and I can quote it. Um, have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and gave some to his companies. Okay, what is that a reference to? That's a reference to 1 Samuel 21. Um, if you go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. David went to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Ahimelech, the priest, the king charged me with a certain matter and said to me, no one is to know anything about our mission and your instructions. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. Okay. He, he's just asking a priest for bread. And that's a legitimate request. I'm, we're hungry. We need some bread. But the priest answered David, I do not have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some of the consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. Okay, now, what's the consecrated bread? And I've given you a list of places where um, it, the, what they call the bread of the presence is mentioned. Okay, we're not going to read those, but... Um, this is bread that is meant only for the priest. And people say, oh, I, I've heard people say, these priests have it easy. They get to eat part of the sacrifices. They get to eat this bread provided for them. Here's what that bread is. They bake it. They put it on a table in the presence of God for seven days. And on the seventh day, the priest can come out, take the bread. Now, you leave bread out on your table for seven days, not wrapped up in a wrapper or anything. And um, then in a clean place, eat it in the presence of people. What's the symbolism of that is often the question. What it symbolizes is we're making an offering to God. Okay. Okay. But guess what God doesn't do? Pagan gods eat. Uh, if you, I've read uh, what's called the Baal Epic. It's, we have this one Baal document. It's called the Baal Epic. What do the gods do? They eat and drink. What does our God do? Well, you leave the bread in his presence. It stays in his presence for seven days. That's it. He doesn't eat it. There's that one psalm that says he doesn't sleep, he doesn't slumber, and there are lots of things that God doesn't do. He doesn't sleep, he doesn't slumber, he doesn't eat. Um, he, uh, there's Elijah story where uh, we learn that um, Baal, uh, people say, where's Baal? Uh, Baal answer us, and uh, Elijah says, maybe he's off on a journey. Maybe he's going, and this is a paraphrase, maybe he's going to the bathroom. Our God doesn't go to the bathroom. He's the eternal spirit who is life itself. And so, um, so David and his men, 
because with the priest's permission, will eat the bread of the presence because the mission outweighed the higher law, supersedes the lower law. Now, I can't tell you when we apply all of this, but if God applies it, so what? He applies it. So, for was picking some grain a violation? Uh, look what Jesus said. Let's go back to Luke's gospel. Then he said to them, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. If Jesus is the Son of Man, who's the Son of Man? That's that phrase from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, about the Messiah. And uh, if you read John's gospel, uh, Jesus is the Son, and he's the creator of the world. If he's the law giver, if the Son of Man says, this is not a violation, who am I going to take, the word of rabbi or the word of the Messiah? That's the argument. Okay, um, if you, we can end up with that story. This is a rather strange story about eating. Um, it doesn't, uh, if you notice my comment, it doesn't let up. If you read the next story, it's another Sabbath day. He enters the synagogue and taught, and then he has another confrontation with the Pharisees. So one of the things that seems to be strange in this book is Jesus' is constant adver adversity being the adversary of the rabbis, of the Pharisees. Do you ever notice uh, he very seldom has a contention with the Sadducees? You know, there are two groups of religious people, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Very seldom does he con have a controversy with the Sadducees. Theologically, the Pharisees, Jesus was a Pharisee in many ways. He believed in the resurrection of the dead. Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. He believed in the ministry of angels. Supposedly, Sadducees don't believe in that. And it go, the list goes on. You can uh, check this out on Google. What does Sadducees believe? But he was the closest to the Pharisee, but in some ways, he's far from them. Why? Because they have all these hedges built that he doesn't agree with. So the thing. Now, You can read through the Gospels and you can see these things. Now, let's go to chapter 6, verse 21. Now, it's just a few verses later. This is a rather strange um, passage, and people argue about this passage. I'll tell you what the argument is. Is this the same sermon as the Sermon on the Mount? But it's the Sermon on the Plain, they call it. Or is another sermon that Jesus delivered? Jesus is what we call, I think I included this, I think I redid it. Yes, I did. If you look at my comment on this, Jesus was a peripatetic preacher. What's that mean? It means he's a traveling man. He goes here and he goes in here. The Greek word peripateo, is, it's based on the Greek word peripateo. It's actually a word in English, but not in everybody's English. But he travels around and my kids used to joke, Dad, are you going to preach your million-dollar sermon? <laughs> I had this one sermon I preached endlessly when people would say on Sunday morning, our preacher's sick, can you come and preach? Yeah, sure, I'll preach that sermon. And my one daughter could quote, she would sit there and do the sermon with me as I did it. Jesus did similar sermons, but it depended on the situation. This is similar to the Sermon on the Mount, but it's called the Sermon on the Plain. I think maybe it was a separate sermon. Okay, then he looked up at his disciples, and this is verse 20, and he said, Blessed are you who are poor, 
Now, in, in Matthew, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, you will laugh. Blessed are you when, you, when, are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defy, defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for your reward is great in heaven. In Matthew, there are 10 of these uh, blessings. In this one, there's four plus one. Is it the same sermon? I don't know. Or are, or are both of them just summaries of the same thing? That doesn't matter to me. But notice what he says. Um, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. What is that referring to? Is that talking about eating? Or is that talking about spiritually filled? If you remember last week, I uh, quoted my friend John Weatherly. Uh, when the text can go two ways, we ask the question, which is it? And John Weatherly would often say, yes. How are the hungry filled? Well, it, is it in this life? One of the ministries of the Christian is to feed the poor, feed the hungry. Um, th this is a very, very important thing of you feed the hungry, okay? The kingdom of God offers food. Or does it dealing with spiritual filling? Or does it deal with in the age to come? Remember we read uh, Isaiah 26, the great feast that happens at the end in which God eats death. God eats the covering which is over all the peoples. He separates the divisions. And uh, are, is it that you get to participate like Matthew 8 uh, says, you get to f participate in the great feast that comes at the end. My answer is yes. It's one of the, uh, maybe both all those things, and uh, if the church is doing what it should do, there's a degree to which we fill the thing. Um, this has been I have I told you last week I have a neighbor that's been bothering me. He keeps all these relatives of his, and he doesn't have enough finances, enough money. So when my wife and I went to church on Sunday. They had a table out filled with cans and stuff and said, free, take it. And so guess what? We did. The church, I didn't feed him. The church fed him. And it, blessed, this guy was blessed. Okay, he was blessed. Blessed are the poor. And you will be filled. But he'll also, he's a Christian, he will also participate in the great feast at the end in which God will, and, but the woe to you who are full now for you will be hungry. You don't get to participate in that great feast. Um, okay, uh, or do you interpret it spiritually? You don't, your spiritual need will not be satisfied. You'll just always have this longing within you for something more, something more, something more. Okay, um, then we go to one of the quick texts, uh, 733 through 35, if you go to chapter 7. Seven thirty-three. For John the Baptist, and Jesus is reacting to the negative treatment he's getting by the Pharisees. So we, we should probably start with um, verse thirty-one. Then what will I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? 
They are like children sitting in the marketplace calling to another, one another. We played the flute for you. You did not dance. That's what Pharisees are saying. Hey, we want you to dance. Dance to our tune. Okay. We wailed, and you did not weep. And then he deals with John the Baptist. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread, drinking no wine, and you say, now this is not the common man, but these are the Pharisees, you say he has a demon. Okay? But the Son of Man, meaning himself, came eating and drinking. He eats and drinks with gluttons, with wine bibbers, tax collectors, sinners, harlots, you, you name it, he would eat with them, and even Pharisees. We'll see that in a second. And you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, the friend of tax collectors and sinners. Which way do you want it? Here's a guy who fasts or eats minimally, eats wretched food. And you say he has a demon. Here's a guy who doesn't fast at this time. And you say he's a glutton. He's a drunkard. Which way do you want it is, is the idea. Um, I always found John's diet kind of interesting. I don't know why I study some of these things. Um, Matthew 3, 4, uh, he eats locusts and wild honey. Now, the wild honey, I'm not sure what the implication. I love honey. I don't know about you, but... <laughs> I love honey. When I was a kid, you'd go out and you'd find a honeycomb. You would grab that thing. Now, I remember sometimes it wasn't as good as other times, especially when it got really, really, really dark. Because you didn't always find it when it was young and fresh, the honey. And so, okay, maybe that's what he's eating. But what is he eating when it says locusts? And um, there are two views the one very few people hold to, that it's, and I can't even pronounce this word, um, it's something, <laughs> yeah, that one, uh, locust, a, a migratory phase of the grasshopper uh, of the family of something or other, even today commonly eaten by poor, poor people in Arabia, Africa, and Syria. Okay, so what's John eating? Not great food. It's not steak. I was tempted once to buy a grasshopper and try it out, and I said no. <laughs> I told you last week about eating this stuff cooked over manure. I did that one, but I did not do this one. I cannot stand the thought of eating a grasshopper. Um, and these are different than our cicadas. And I, I looked at them once before I knew what this was and said, I'm not going to eat that. My kids had a duck, and the duck in the one um, locust plague with the cicadas, that thing, everybody else's duck, it had brothers and sisters, and the guy who actually owned the duck but loaned it to me to hold while he was in college, it was amazed. He said, the other ones aren't this big. Well, this duck would eat so many cicadas, its gullet, that little part in the front would be filled, and it would be... Thump, 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 thump. And that thing was fat, and it was wondrously, I wanted to cut his head off and eat it, but <laughs> my kids wouldn't let me do that uh, for some strange reason. So um, you can't please people is one of the things. You can't please people when they revere their interpretation, their hedges that go around laws. So this gets us to the last section I'm going to read, chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Okay, now, in this section, um, 36 through 50, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. He went into the Pharisee's house, 
and took his place at the table. Notice who Jesus is eating with, a Pharisee. They are his adversaries. Is this a trap? It may be. And, but Jesus takes the opportunity to call the sinners to repentance. And the sinner here is the Pharisee. If we read the rest of the story, which we should always do, um, but then an, um, something happens. Um, verse 37 uh, and 38, an unexpected guest, I call it on my outline. And the woman in the city who was a sinner, now that's Luke's evaluation, she is a sinner. Now, we don't know exactly what it was she was. Having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. Now, her coming into the house seems strange to us. From the things I've read, this is not unusual that the poor were allowed to, at a feast, to go in and ask for the scraps from the table. Well, she's not asking for scraps from the table. But what does it mean she's a sinner? Um, is it she has a specific sin? Is she a prostitute? Is she um, whatever? Um, or does she have a whole list of sins? Um, I find this interesting in um, Greek. In Greek, the word sinner is a class term. It's not in the feminine. They have feminine and masculine endings in Greek, but it's not a feminine word. It's a masculine word. She's in this class of sinner. What does that mean? Well, it could mean she has a specific sin. We don't, we're not told what it was. Or is it just she's that group of people who are shunned by those who follow the traditional rules of the Pharisees? In other words, she's just not religious. Okay, if you're not religious like they're religious, you're a sinner. That's what I think. You can look, I give you some text where the word sinner is used. What's important is we don't know any former story. I'm assuming there's a former story. This woman is distraught. got to focus my eyes here. Having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. That's an expensive jar. Don't know what the ointment was. She stood behind him at his feet. Now, how does that work? Stood behind him at his feet. Well, they sort of lie down when they, they're eating at times. They don't do this always. A picture of Jesus in a chair is not maybe how it worked. It could be that way, but he's probably, I would do it, but I'm not, I'm too old to get back up. Uh, uh, someone said, uh, how old are you? And I said, well, I got my um, handicap tag this week, and I, I made a deal with my doctor. I wouldn't use it unless I was really bad feeling, and I've had, I've used it twice, two weeks, in the past two weeks, and that and people say, well, how old are you? And I said, well, I went into an antique store, and they wouldn't let me out. <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's uh, whatever. <laughs> let me continue with this. Um, and having stood behind the feet of him, weeping, with the tears she began to wet his, his feet, and with the hairs of her head, she was wiping and kissing the feet of him and was anointing them with perfume. I, I would find this difficult. I, would, I agree with the Pharisee here. This is a difficult situation. But um, that's what she was doing with Jesus. 
Why? We're not told why. But what we look into is what the Pharisee is doing. Now, notice what he, he is, quote, unquote, I think, a judgmental person. I admit I would probably be judgmental at this point, too. But notice how he's judging this situation. What does he say? Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, now, notice how our English text is phrased. If a man were a prophet, he would have known who and what this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Okay, now, in English, when you say, if he were, you're saying, basically, and he's not. And it's the same way in Greek. The way they construct this in Greek, um, he's saying, if he, well, we can do the English, if he were a sinner, and he's not, or if he were a prophet, and he's not, he's implicitly thinking that, he's denying that Jesus is a prophet, um, but Jesus is going to prove that he is. And having answered, Jesus said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Now, notice what I would call the hypocrisy of this guy. What he is thinking, this guy's not a prophet. And then what he says, teacher, he replied, um, he, he, Simon, I have something to do, tell you um, and say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. He outwardly acknowledges Jesus, but that's not what he's saying inwardly. He's not a prophet. You catch that. He, he's complimenting him and acting out the part. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which of the two will love him more? Now, when you ask a Pharisee a question, he can't condemn you if you can't answer the question. He's asking, Jesus is asking him, how do you interpret this? Well, the Pharisee is going to answer him. This is so many times Pharisees won't answer Jesus. He asks, I don't want to say trick questions, but he asks hard questions of them. Which one will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. You're right. Then turning to the woman, now he's not going to talk to her yet. Now, the Pharisee's in front of him. I'm going to turn around. Then turning to the woman, remember she's behind him. He said to Simon, do you see this woman? I have entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. That's a tradition. That's a good tradition. You should, in their culture, you should wash the guy's feet or have one of your servants wash the guy's feet. But she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. I got to look at you. Uh, one of the traditional greetings. Uh, this was always hard for me to do when I was in Arab country. <laughs> you kiss the guy on the cheek. I forget how many times and I did it wrong once. I kissed the wrong cheek first and then <laughs> there's a procedure for doing this and they, no, no, Mr. Dan, you get to kiss this cheek first. And they, okay, I, I'm confused. Um, I got to get, um, you gave me no kiss, and she's not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil. Another thing, because your head gets blistered in the sun, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, well, she did do something, 
have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. And that's one of the higher laws. Uh, James is going to quote this, and he said, uh, you know, love covers a multitude of sins. A yeah, higher law is, yeah, you can keep these lower laws, but she has kept the higher law, which is to show love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Now, I wonder who in the story is that? Is that Simon the Pharisee or is that just a general principle? He's not denying that Simon may have been forgiven. But he's saying, this is why you love little. So meals are a great time. Jesus is accepting the Pharisee. He is. He went to his house. He's eating. Jesus also is accepting this, this woman who has an unknown sin. Then he said to her, this is such a great conclusion to this story. Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. One of the things that amazes me in this type of story is what people think, and Jesus knows what they're thinking. And I get confused at times why sometimes someone is forgiven and someone else does the very same, or appears to be the very same thing, and is not forgiven. Why is that? Well, there's more to the story than we read. And sometimes what is the difference, and I know this is an interpretation, but sometimes what is the difference is what's on the inside of the man or the woman. What's on the inside of Simon the Pharisee? If this man were a prophet, what's on the inside of his guess? Oh, who is he that he should forgive sins? What's on the inside of the woman? It's love for Jesus, for love for God. And I don't know how she feels about Simon. Is she listening to what's going on? I don't know. But she would probably be, and this is a bit, I'm saying this out of experience, people who are forgiven and know that they are forgiven are more apt to forgive than people who don't. You know, we have to, if we're forgiven, uh, I spoke last week about praying every day the Lord's Prayer and starting my daily devotions, what bothers me. Now, I can confess this to you. You can accept it or not. What bothered me today when our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. If you, Jesus also said in Matthew's gospel, if you show mercy, you'll receive mercy. If you don't show mercy, you won't receive mercy. And what does that say to me? I need to be more of a merciful person with those with whom I disagree, with those that I find 
lifestyle detestable. I have to lead them to want to serve God, to be God's person. And not just to say, oh, they're a sinner, whatever reason. Is it because they're irreligious? No, they have no religion whatsoever. Or is it because they're the enemy of God? It doesn't matter. I have to want to win them to Christ Jesus, my Lord, and to get them to love Christ Jesus. Maybe then that things will change in their life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask for your forgiveness upon us. When we have judged people and harshly judged them, when we avoid them because they are so sinful, we pray, Father, we'd be reminded of Jesus in this story. Father, we pray for your protection, not just because we have hedges around our, your commandment, but because your spirit lives within us and your spirit moves us to be compassionate, to be giving, to be kind. And may people be drawn to the Christ because of us. We pray for the presence of the Christ in our worship services this Sunday. Uh, we pray that as we partake of the Lord's Supper, that we will uh, be eating the great meal with Jesus. That may he come into our presence and eat with us, and may we eat with him. As we hear the sermon, Father, we pray that we would hear your word. And Father, as we sing, may we truly be filled with praise and seek to praise the living God and the Christ whom he has sent. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.